Yep. It is. It is Robbie the robot, right? Yeah, from uh, Forbidden Planet. Yeah, this is sources our second Robbie sighting. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and, then they kinda, and and they kind of used him as the uh, model for the robot on Lost in Space. He he, he looked a little different. Oh, but, absolutely. That's that's kind of where yeah. most people know him. Yeah. Which, by the way, as somebody who's wa- you watched Lost in Space, right? Yeah, yeah. You should watch the new Netflix show. That's what I um I was gonna watch the pilot the other night and then I didn't get a chance to. I want to because I do. I love the original. Yeah, but. I, I'm only five episodes in, mm-hmm. and I'm really actually happy they, uh, they they obviously have the family. Yeah. But they change a lot, and it's not just mm-hmm. like revamped. It's like we're actually changing the story, and I think it it helps. Oh, that's good. That's it good. It helps. It's no longer Swiss Family Robinson. Oh well, that's cool. Do they have a do they have, do they have a Doctor Smith character? They do. Uh, it's okay. played by uh, uh, Parker Posey. Oh wow! Oh cool. Yeah, the, uh, but the, uh, the this is definitely not a spoiler at all. But they aren't the only ship that makes it to the planet, which changes oh, the cool. dynamic a lot. Oh cool! It's cool. more of a colony than Swiss Family Robinson. Oh nice. But yeah, no, I would I would check it out. It's if you in, the nice thing about it is. Sci-fi lately, and by lately I mean since like Battlestar Galactica ten mm-hmm. years ago, has been all like ho drum, human race is gonna die and everything else. This mm-hmm. is actually like, you know, hey, we can we can make this work. Like, hooray okay. for the human race sci-fi, which hasn't been around since like Star Trek, and uh, Discovery doesn't count because it doesn't do it either. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I'm hosting, so whenever you're good, I'll. Start rolling. <clears throat> Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. Welcome to episode 51. And I have a bone to pick with myself and with Brandon on this one. <laughs> because Brandon's, you know, we last week was episode 50 of the Twilight Zone, but it was like our third or fourth, uh, 53rd or 54th episode. I went back and looked. And our season re- recap show and our intro show we're all special episodes that were not numbered. So uh-huh. technically, this is episode 51, so I don't have to change the numbering anywhere, <laughs> so that's good. Um, for those who are watching and trying to keep track, we're, our, my goal is to confuse you, and I hope I'm doing a good job. <laughs> so uh, welcome to <laughs> Zonisodes episode 51, which is going to be a fun one, I believe. We are talking yeah. about The Invaders. Season two's probably most famous episode and one of the most famous episodes of the Twilight Zone. And I'm looking forward to discussing its merits. Uh, I'm Scott and with me is Brandon Davis. So, Brandon, let's dive right into the invaders. Go ahead and tell us what Rod has to say. The sure. only real, well, no, the robots talk too. So, yeah. But really, the only real true discussion during the episode is Rod. Mm hmm. All right, this is one of the -the out-of-the-way places, the unvisited places, bleak, wasted, dying. This is a farmhouse, handmade, crude, a house without electricity or gas, a house untouched by progress. This is the woman who lives in the house, a woman who's been alone for many years, a strong, simple woman whose only problem up until this moment has been that of acquiring enough food to eat. A woman about to face terror, which is even now coming at her from the Twilight Zone. And the plot for the Invaders is um, this is a, I was talking to Brandon. This is a hard one mm-hmm. because, as I mentioned, there is no real true dialogue, and this is right. really one scene that just goes on for the whole episode. Mm-hmm. So I will give you a brief plot, but I, this is one of those ones where if you haven't seen the episode, uh, there's not much I can help you with here. So. Agnes, uh, Agnes Moorhead is the actress, but mm-hmm. we don't know the the uh, the woman's name. She's just an older woman who is living in a cabin. She lives alone, uh, and either she is mute or she just doesn't feel like she needs to talk because she's not going to. Mm-hmm. Uh, after hearing strange noises above her on her kitchen roof, she goes upstairs to find small intruders in her house. These are little walking around Robbie the Robots for those of us who have uh, grown up on uh, 60s sci-fi. And Robbie has been on Twilight Zone a couple times too. This is our second Robbie sighting. It will not be our last. The two tiny figures move around uh, her house and uh, just 
completely uh, give her a terrible time. They use electric shock on her. They pick up a, a kitchen knife and try to uh, stab her, and they do cut her. They give her radiation burns. Uh, she just all around has a pretty bad time dealing with these little invaders. Finally, she fights uh, them off and finds their spaceship that she royally beats to hell, killing the little men in the ship. And then we hear the little men calling back to their uh, home base, saying that the uh, planet is not suitable for landing on again because there's no way to invade this planet. And we find out that the ship itself reads U.S. Air Force Space Probe Number 1. So, surprise, the guys in the robot suits were us. And the giant little woman was not a human. The game. Yep. <laughs> so, I'm hosting. I forgot that. <laughs> Brandon, give me your uh, opening uh, thoughts about the invaders. This is a really interesting episode. I mean, we've seen... Thinking back to even the pilot, where the the most most of the episode where most of the episode is just one person, and uh, even back to the opening episode of this uh, season, um, with uh, King Nine will not return, um, where it's mostly one. But those episodes at least had dialogue, where the person had inner monologues with themselves and spoke out loud and everything. There's literally after Rod's opening, there's nothing. Agnes Moorhead does everything with just with just her face with her body language with noises um and she i mean for basically for 25 minutes and um it, it's really you, you know that this is the first real sort of also sci-fi episode of the twilight zone we've seen in a while too i mean just just pure sci-fi um and it, it really stands out. I mean, not just in this season, but we really haven't seen an episode like this in the entire series yet. And, uh, you know, I, I can see why it's it's such a highly regarded episode. First, because Agnes Moore has just a brilliant actress, but um, also just because it, it really is brutal at times. I mean, just to see this woman constantly terrorized by these people. Uh, who, who, well, we find out they're people. We don't know they're people at the beginning. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a sci-fi horror movie with this interesting little twist at the end. Um, and, and I'm interested to talk through this because I'm really, I, I think it's a very, very good episode, but I'm not quite sure yet where I'm going to rank this. Well, so, that, so as we talk about this, we'll we'll see. That's going to be interesting because I was going to rely on you a lot because, oh. <laughs> um, honest, honestly, this is a good episode. Don't and don't hate me, but I never understood the love for this episode, and it's it, it's it's familial too. I, when I talked to my father about uh, doing mm -hmm. a Twilight Zone podcast, the first thing he said was the invaders. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one of his favorite episodes, uh, and he grew up in the 50s and 60s, so he saw him first run, and it's mm -hmm. one of his favorite episodes. And I know it's a favorite episode for a lot of people. Yeah. And this conversation, I, I'm not sure where it's going to go. Uh, yeah. For me, I mean, it definitely, as you said, it's, it's, it's very hard sci-fi. It definitely yeah. has its bona fides. It's written by uh, Richard Matheson. Uh, yeah. And Richard Matheson, for those who may not know, uh, he's most well known for I Am Legend, uh, which has been uh, made into several films, including the Omega Man uh, and, and the Will Smith I Am Legend, which is not as good as the Omega Man. Uh, <laughs> but he's a, he, he wrote 16 different episodes for Twilight Zone, including Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. But this guy, he's, he, his, his work is well known by anyone who's a fan of science fiction. I mean, he wrote The Shrinking Man, which was uh, cha uh, which was made into The Incredible Shrinking Man, the film of the 50s. Uh, he, he wrote Stir of Echoes, which uh, that film uh, with Kevin Bacon is uh, one I think that uh, most people never saw, but it's a really good film. Uh, and uh, he also wrote What Dreams May Come, which is one of my favorite uh, Robin Williams films. So this guy, he's, he, he's wrote a lot of stuff that has been turned into uh, film and TV. So uh, you, you can see kind of the bona fides there. 
Um, and I think I, I appreciate when Twilight Zone tries to experiment with things. Mm -hmm. I, when I get bored is when they do the same thing over and over again, which is what yeah. I wouldn't have a problem with at the end of this episode because they do the same damn thing they've done three or four times now. But the idea of following this woman around, no dialogue, uh, and just basically trying to one-shot this thing as much as they can uh, is – it's 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 an interesting watch. Um, for me, it kind of drags a little bit, and I know – uh, it, it's trying to build suspense, but mm -hmm. there, there is just some times there where we could probably spend a little less time lingering on her, her expressions and more on what she's doing and more of the action of what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell is uh, I, I'm not sold on this being the best twilight zone ever. And I was kind of hoping you would talk me into <laughs> it, but that sounds like it's not going to be the case. <laughs> So let's talk about what's good about it, Brandon. Yeah. Well, number one for me is Agnes Moorhead. I mean, she is, um, I mean, this is a woman who is in Citizen Kane. Um, she's, uh, she was part of Orson Welles' Mercury Troupe. Um, a lot of classic movies. She'd been nominated for several Oscars. Um, probably best known for playing in Dora on Bewitched. Um, but um, just, just a really, really quality amazing actress and you in order for this episode to be anything you have to cast well and rod chose well and um she you're with her the whole time and you feel for her um and i think i think her performance is one of the strengths of it and i think like you said even though sometimes it might be repetitive i do think the suspense works um i some of it is very um uh, and this is an actual word in the dictionary. Some of it is Hitchcockian, um, <laughs> and uh, it, it it does build. And uh, there really there is genuine terror. I mean, especially when she's getting stabbed and burned. I mean, that's that's pretty brutal for '60s television. Uh, and you and you feel the pain. You feel the pain from her from the noises she's making and the expression she's giving. And I, I also think it's. I, I'm bringing my own sort of thoughts to it, but, um, you know, there's just real paranoia about this episode. Like something is always out to get you, which is we're in the era of the Cold War, of course. You're thinking about something being out there and out to get you. And uh, so, so that's part of it too. And I, you know, it's interesting watching these in the way that we have. If you're just picking this episode out of a bunch and you see the twist, and you see that the um, that the aliens are us. Um, that might take you a little more by surprise than it would having what you and I've been doing, watching them straight through when we've seen twists like this before. So it didn't come as a huge shock, but it it, it is a really really interesting twist that this woman is some sort of giant um, giant you know not earthly being. And, and and so it, it really is well constructed. And like I said, I really have one major fault with it, and that's probably the same that you do, and we'll probably get into it later. But a lot can be said for the episode. Yeah, you know, uh, definitely. Her, and it, it's always nice for Twilight Zone because whenever we do get these female-driven episodes, the, mm -hmm. the female actresses or actors do, do an amazing job every single mm -hmm. time. Uh, they're always standouts. She is a, a standout, as others have been. Mm -hmm. And you're, the visceral nature of the the burning uh, and seeing yeah. the burns happen and hearing her her anguished kind of screams and grunts and just it definitely makes your skin crawl. And that's it, mm -hmm. it, for today, let alone the 1960s. That's really impressive, and I, I really do like that about this episode. I also do like the fact that they, they again they went for it and decided we're not going to have any dialogue except for the uh, mm -hmm. the humans calling back to to uh, home base at the very end. We're just going to not know what these things are. Just have these little six inch uh, toy robots running around trying to kill you. Um, mm -hmm. And so it does really well there. I, I think some of the camera work is done very well as uh, too. It definitely builds suspense. Um, it, it, there, there's nothing really neg negative to say about this thing. It's, there's a lot of good to it. Um, 
but yeah, I think you hit on it very well. So what are some things you didn't like about it? Uh, well, and, and I wanted to, I didn't mention this when I was talking about last time, but this kind of goes into what I was talking about. I don't know if you saw A Quiet Place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, John, I, I've heard when, of it, and I've heard, I, I when, know the when, spoilers of it. When when I was watching A Quiet Place, I got an Invaders vibe mm-hmm. to it. So I can I think Krasinski is very original, but I think he pulled a little from this episode. But um, written by a guy from uh, Bedendorf, a couple guys from Bedendorf, Iowa. Yeah. So uh, my uh, my my major gripe with it, like you said, is it doesn't really have a big. It's the plot structure it doesn't really have a beginning a middle and an end it's kind of just repetitive suspense over and over again and um with with a nice little button at the end um well acted and well done um but it, it doesn't really i was trying to i was trying to think about what the episodes that I've given a 10 to have done, like Monsters Are Do on Mabel Street, Eye of the Beholder, uh, The Hitchhiker, uh, Walking Distance, um, some of the best episodes of The Twilight Zone we've seen, and they all kind of leave you with a punch in the gut at the end. Um, and, and this one, while I definitely remembered and thought about it days after I'd seen it, and this is one I'd seen before, but I, I rewatched it, um it it just it i don't know it just doesn't leave you with the same kind of the same kind of cerebral the same kind of cerebral thinking that the other episodes do um which is why i'm still struggling with where i'm going to rank it um but you know a, a very very good very well done episode and yet it just there are times where it does feel repetitive and it does drag somewhere in the middle yeah i mentioned i I mentioned in my opening piece that um the suspense kind of drags on uh, and so I, i won't hit on that one again what my biggest issue is is the twist at the end oh okay and and the reason is is we've done it before and part of that is hindsight being 2020 i completely understand some yeah. of the times we've done it before in Twilight Zone, uh, we haven't done yet because we haven't gotten there. But sure. when I rewatch all these Twilight Zone episodes, there is about four or five different episodes where, surprise, it was actually us all along. And it just kind of gets yeah. tedious. The one we have dealt with already was Third from the Sun. Yeah. Which we know we're watching these humans trying to get off an ill fated world, and then we find out at the very end they're going to Earth. Uh, so, and that actually one was written by Richard Matheson as well. Uh, so we flip it this time and it's the humans coming to another planet and we're going to do it again with giants again, where humans are going to land on a planet and they're going to be stepped on. I mean, this, 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 this idea of, um, it's us or they're coming to us or vice versa. It's a twist that gets used, I think too much. And it really kind of pulls me out of it. Um, I would have been much happier with her just being this little old lady in a cabin somewhere in Appalachia. And she has, and she's the reason why we were never invaded because she fought off the first wave. I think that would have been a more fun story uh, yeah. than having the whole, Oh, it's, it's us and we're the invaders. And if you're going to go that route, if you're going to make us the bad guys, make us the bad guys. Because at the very end, they're just saying, well, this is not a good place. It's not suitable for colonization or whatever they say. Mm-hmm. No, you you, you got to make this sound like we are the conquering invaders who have taken over planet after planet, and we're, this is our next stop. Make yeah. us the bad guys, because then I think that would actually be more risk-taking. Make humans just terribly bad. In this case, it just seems like they land on a planet, and they started getting chased around by a giant, mm-hmm. and they had to try to kill the giant. Okay, yeah. so it's Jack and the Beanstalk. And... It's it, it's it's a little too cute for me, especially in an episode that tried so hard to be experimental, to change things up, and to make us have to really think and make us really pay attention. The end just kind of falls flat, and it it, it really hurts the episode for me. Hmm. And now I'm going to get a lot of hate mail, which you can <laughs> send to the front row movie reviews at gmail.com, or you can post your comments below the video. Hmm. Feel free. Uh, I will definitely respond to all of them. I love your hate. I feed off of your hate. (laughs) 
Brandon, any kind of cl- closing comments you have on this episode? Uh, no, it's um, and I the the interesting thing is I usually sort of fall in line where um, sort of the the uh, the very popular thinking is with a lot of uh, with a lot of um, like, like considering what the best episodes and things are of all time and everything and it it didn't kind of take me by surprise where I yeah I think this is an excellent episode but I don't put it in that upper echelon quite so that it, this is this so far has kind of been my biggest surprise I think of uh, the series of my reaction to it mm-hmm. yeah I'll be interested to see how our scores come out because uh, up to this very moment, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to score this sucker. But let's go ahead and do it. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we uh, score these episodes on a scale of 1 to 10, and we compare them to other episodes of The Twilight Zone. So a 1 would be one of the worst episodes of all time, much like The Bewitching Pool, and uh, 10 would be one of the best episodes of all time, which would be like Walking Distance, as uh, Brandon mentioned earlier. And a five would be an average episode of The Twilight Zone, which, because Twilight Zone is arguably one of the best series of all time, an average episode of The Twilight Zone is a pretty damn good episode. So, Brandon, where would you have Invaders fall on a scale of one to ten? It's definitely it's definitely an above average episode. And yet when I think about the episodes I've given a ten to, which this episode usually ranks among, it doesn't leave me with the same kind of afterthought so i can't give it a 10 um the the most similar thing that i remember uh, i remember having sort of the same reaction to was time enough at last where it's mm-hmm. sort of concerned one of the all-time best episodes and yet there's just something about it that i can't quite give it a 10 and i didn't have the same problem with the twist at the end that you did i just think it gets a little too repetitive so i'm gonna give it a nine I'm glad you point out time enough at last. I have a way of poo pooing the the favorite episodes of all time. I give <laughs> time enough at last a six. Oh, see, I gave it a nine. So. I know you did. I gave it a six. <laughs> so uh, I'm not gonna poo poo this one as much. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna give it a seven. I think okay. it's it's very much an above average Twilight Zone episode. It's a good mm-hmm. Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> But I'm not going to walk away thinking, oh, my God, that was an amazing piece of TV Mm -hmm. history. And part of it may just be because we're looking at this 50 some odd years later and uh, just it's to a point where now where we've seen it all. And I I, I definitely Mm -hmm. confirm that bias when I already have pointed out that we're going to have this very same twist again. And when we have this very same twist again, I'm going to poo-poo it every single time because I'm tired of this twist. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's just where I'm at on it. I, I think mm-hmm. it's an above average episode, and uh, I, I don't think it's in that upper echelon. I, I was about to give it an eight, but I started mm-hmm. looking back at some of my eights like Nightmare as a Child and Execution mm-hmm. and, and Mirror Image and I and Walking Distance I gave an eight to, actually. And this is not up to that par, so I'm going to give it a seven. So, uh, Brandon, go ahead and tell us what Rod had to say, and then we'll wrap us up. Sure. These are the invaders, the tiny beings from the tiny place called Earth, who would take the giant step across the sky to the question marks that sparkle and beckon from the vastness of the universe only to be imagined. The invaders, who found out that a one-way ticket to the stars beyond has the ultimate price tag, and we have just seen it entered in a ledger that covers all the transactions in the universe, a bill stamped paid in full, and to be found on file in the Twilight Zone. Just remember, when we leave the Earth, the giant old woman is going to stomp the living (laughs) hell out of us, so we should stay here on our little blue planet. Well, Brandon, I I, I have some good news for you. Uh, Yes. We're we're definitely moving uh, ahead now. We've gotten that little hiccup behind us, that Mm -hmm. three-and-a-half-month hiccup, (laughs) or four-and-a-half-month hiccup. Yes. 30... 2.7% 2.7% done with wow. the Twilight Zone. After next week's episode, we will be a third of the way through the Twilight Zone. Nice so to know. I, th- I think, I think uh, we'll, 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 we have a little bit of catch-up, <laughs> but yeah. we're still making some good headway. I like yeah, that. Yeah, we are. So <laughs> you can find us at thefrontrowmoviereviews.com, or you can find us on Facebook at the Front Row Movie Reviews, or 
at Zonisodes Podcast. You can also email us all your hate mail about how The Invaders is the most amazing <laughs> episode ever and we have no idea what we're talking about <laughs> to the front row movie reviews at gmail.com. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please make sure to subscribe and give us a review on your podcast app of choice. Those iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify reviews really help us move up the chain and the search engines, and we'd love to have more people checking us out. And if you're watching us on YouTube, same idea. Give us a like and subscribe, and give us some comments below. We'd love to talk to you about that. We always reply to our comments whether you like it or not, so uh, please check it out. Uh, Until we talk next time, and next time we're going to be talking about a penny – for your thoughts, which is another one of those interesting episodes. I'm Scott, I'm Scott and with me as always is Brandon Davis. And we will see you on the couch. And if you burn me with radiation, I will stomp the living hell out of you. <laughs> the end. Yeah, that about says it. <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that. Mm-hmm.